Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you've called your people to be here today. We've come from many different places, different circumstances in life. We've all come here for one reason, and that is to be in your presence. We're hungering for you. We're thirsting for you. Fill us through your spirit, with your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles to Luke 22, uh, verses 14 to 20. And we're reading the whole verse of several verses there. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with, with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat, eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he broke, or then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I will go ahead and stop there and not read verse 20. It talks about the cup and it's, it continues Jesus' monologue. But here we are again, here we go again. The last time we did this, it was exactly 13 Sabbaths ago. Another communion service. What new does it bring? What new thing does it bring? It's deja vu all over again. And as I said, our denominational practice is to do the ordinance of humility, that is foot washing, and the Lord's Supper, that is we call it the communion service, every quarter, either at the end or at the beginning of a new quarter. Uh, Four times a year for as long as uh, you've been a Christian, or as long as you've been a member of a family that's a Christian. And that's a lot of communion services for for an entire lifetime, right? Especially if you grew up in the church. Can you count how many times you've had communion services? How many times you've participated in the Lord's Supper and washing each other's feet? I started mine before I became, really, I became a believer. uh, You know, joining my entire class in Mass. My family was self-identified or self-identified as Protestant um, Adventists, in fact, but we weren't practicing it really. Um, The village uh, I grew up in, they were practically everyone, they're 99%, uh, just about, uh, were are are Catholic. Um, And the village knew that we were different uh, because my grandparents converted to the faith. And, uh, but my grandparents had long gone. They came here to the United States when I was a little, a little boy. And they left my mom to be sort of like the matriarch of the family. And my mom dropped the ball. And practically left the faith. But the village knew that we were at least self-identifying as Protestants in, 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 a, in a village filled with Catholic Christians. Um, my great-grandmother uh, tr- uh, tried to uh, keep the fire or the flame um, from completely uh, going out. And for a while, she was the one that took us to church with us until that church, which, was, which, was, uh, which met in my great-uncle's uh, 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 house, uh, that church disappeared. And so nobody went to church, and we didn't go to church anymore. But out of respect, because we still self-identified as Adventist Christians, the Catholic catechist, the person that was in charge by the priests in, in the village to make sure that everybody learned the doctrines of the Catholic faith, asked my mom out of respect um, if it would be okay for me and my sister uh, to attend Mass. And being predominantly a Catholic village, everyone in the school went to Mass. Whenever the priest came to town, came to the village. 
And mom said, fine, it's all right. Uh, They can join in, except for one thing. They cannot partake of the bread and the wine. And so there I was, everybody at school, me and my sister were just about the only ones, as if I remember correctly, who who stayed seated while everybody marched up to the front and the priest would dispense of the ostia and the wine one by one, and everybody opened their mouths, and the priest did it one by one. This was my first experience of the Lord's Supper without the bread and wine, watching others do it. Well, I got me and my sister got to watch. But you know, you know, mass without bread and wine is like Filipino meal without rice. How do you have a meal? It's, 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 if you're Filipino, you can, understand, you can understand what I'm talking about. It is not a proper meal if there's no rice in it. And how can it be a proper meal if, there's, if the, burger is, it's, the burger is without a patty? It's not an American burger. Right? I know some of you do this at In-N-Out quite a bit. You kids, I, I see this all the time. Uh, when after, after games, Pine Hills uh, kids, I, I see you guys, especially those of you guys that, have been, that are growing up vegetarian, praise the Lord. You go line up at In-N-Out, and I, you get to order uh, burgers, and uh, when somebody says, what, you know, and then you get to say, please take the patty out. It's not the real thing if the bread and wine are missing. So while all our classmates marched to the front of the altar where the priest was dispensing of the emblems of bread and the wine, we stayed seated and we watched. But without the participation in the actual thing, after a while, the exercise became empty and hollow and boring. We just sat there. Bored to death until that long mass ended. And it went on for quite some time because the priest was there only every so often. But there is boredom of a different kind, the Adventist kind, not at being prevented from taking or partaking of the bread and wine, but boredom from endless repetition And what we expect, we've come to expect that whenever communion Sabbath comes around, just expect that the church church will not end until about one o'clock. I think we do a a, a better job than most uh, church Adventist churches in um, being done at at a reasonable time. You agree? And it takes a lot of planning to do that. In order, to, in order for the worship service to, to, to have its flow and, and we're not here too long. But one gets the feeling that whenever we come uh, to communion Sabbath, that it's deja vu. It's deja vu all over again. It's all over again, all over again. We've come to expect that communion Sabbath is going to be tedious. And some even, for various reasons, stay away. Not the least of which is because they know that it's going to be super long. Or perhaps others stay away because they feel unworthy to partake. They stay away because of that and other reasons besides. And if you're a child in a more traditional Adventist church, you get to watch too. You don't, you're not allowed to participate. You'd sit there fidgeting, wondering when the torture will be over. And if you're an adult Christian, you've probably done this for many years. How many years has it been since you were baptized and you started taking or partaking of the communion of the bread and wine or new wine? If, let's say, you've been a a Christian for 25 years, according to our practice as Adventist Christians, 25 times 4... You would have done it if, 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 granted, it's perfect attendance for you. Assuming that it's perfect attendance, 25 times 4, you've done it for at least, or maximum, 100. Well, okay, fine. Throw in a few more surprises when you decide to visit a church and, and, and you realize that they're on a different schedule. And you realize, you sit there, oh no, I just had communion last week. 
They're having communion this week. That's extra. Two communion services in a quarter is more than some can bear. How many times do we need to do communion to get the point about remembering? Easy enough to remember? We can do it in the privacy of our own thoughts and our own devotions. Do we have to do it here? And do we have to do it every so often? And I would say, well, stop complaining. Other churches do it every week. We can dispense perhaps of the formality without enduring the long or the longer service that we've come to expect. But what's behind this boredom among some? Well, if I may answer my own rhetorical question, what's behind this boredom among some is what's behind every boredom. And if I'm not mistaken, there are two things that are you know, that happen, uh, uh, that, that lead people to, to be bored about things. Number one is a lack of a full appreciation or understanding of what's in front of you. And the other is the lack of action. You don't get bored doing something. You, you get bored just sitting there doing nothing. Which is part of the reason why we try to make the communion service a lot more participatory than, we nor- we're, than we're normally accustomed to. Because it is truly a participation not just watching or a passive thing for us. But what's behind this boredom? What's behind this boredom is a lack of understanding or full understanding of the meaning of what we do here every quarter of each year. Lack of understanding and lack of action that leads to fidgeting. And boredom. So, what is the Lord's Supper for? It was briefly explained to us by our youth pastor today in prepping us and getting, setting things up for us. And that was well done. As Adventist Christians, our understanding of the meaning of the Lord's Supper falls in line with classic Protestant interpretation. We are, after all, Protestants. And we make no apologies for that. But to understand the Protestant way of understanding the Lord's Supper, we need to start from the Roman Catholic understanding or interpretation. And perhaps the one person that first encapsulated or or systematized uh, what today is common Roman Catholic understanding of of the Lord's Supper is, is somebody by the name of Thomas Aquinas. Catholics believe in what's known as, don't try to memorize this. I didn't put it up there so you don't get stuck memorizing this very technical term. But the term is consubstantiation. Consubstantiation is a mouthful. That is to say that the substance of the bread and wine transform. That's the word. Did I say con? I I should have said tran substantiation. I made a mistake. The substance of the bread and wine transform into the very physical body and blood of Jesus Christ, at the same, while at the same time retaining their outside appearance as bread and wine. And, you know, we're not here, I'm not here, uh, we're not here to revisit the battles of the past, or to even, I'm not in, interested in caricaturing uh, this, this uh, uh, understanding in, in, in whatever way, shape, or form. But it is not true that, 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 that the Catholic Christians are thinking of repeating Jesus' sacrifice whenever they do this, whenever they participate in the, in the, uh, in the Lord's Supper. What they are emphasizing is reverence for the sacrament. And that it is not to be taken lightly that the presence of Jesus Christ transcends just being present in the room. That the presence of Jesus Christ is the presence of of, of his, his actual body and blood in the bread and in the new wine. 
It is this understanding, however, is a step too far for us Protestants and for good reasons. And I'm not here to rehash all the arguments that have come and gone in relation to this debate. I'm here to fully affirm our, our Protestant roots and saying that transubstantiation is a big step too far. It is, however, for Protestants, for us Protestants to, to, to know what our position is, to understand it, and among Protestants of which, of whom we, are, we as Adventists are a, a part, a small part, but an important part, there are two major positions that we need to understand. One of them was, uh, the, the first position uh, was enunciated, first of all, by Martin Luther, uh, the father of, of Protestant Reformation. And Martin Luther starts by saying, and by the way, this position is called constant substantiation. Um, yeah, that's the reason why I didn't want you to memorize it. <laughs> Martin Luther starts by saying that the Lord is present in the bread and wine um, by commingling with it, not necessarily transforming the actual bread and the actual wine and, and, and the bread becoming his body and the wine becoming his blood. He somehow mysteriously makes himself present not only in the emblems, but in the room and in the act itself. He is present there. And there, that is, there is a powerful truth in what Luther says. The bread and wine themselves do not magically turn into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus simply comes alongside the emblems, alongside your participation, alongside the very act itself, this very, the very, very worship service itself, and infuses that with his presence. Isn't that beautiful? This approach highlights the necessity of seeing everything that is done in here by faith. By faith. Because if it is not actually transubstantiation, that is to say, whether you like it or not, you know, if, as, as soon as you, you eat that bread and you drink that wine, you're eating and drinking the substance of Jesus Christ, whether or not it is taken by faith. Well, hopefully it's taken by faith if you're participating. But Luther's approach makes faith a very important factor in experiencing the presence of Jesus Christ in the very act of participation in the Lord's Supper. But there is a second interpretation among us Protestant Christians, and it comes from the roots of this, come from the Radical Reformation. Um, which takes Luther's, uh, Luther's uh, interpretation or uh, uh, understanding a step further. And perhaps the one person that uh, propounds this uh, understanding is the Swiss reformer Ulrich Zwingli, who believed that the bread and wine are symbolic representations, symbolic representations of Christ's blood and body. That is what we as Adventists feel a lot of affinity to. This is called memorialism. They point back to Jesus' sacrifice once and for all at the cross. And this approach encourages reflection. That whenever we come here, or even as we come here in our homes or wherever we find ourselves out there in the world outside of the walls of this church, that we would have made the proper reflection and the proper preparation and a proper understanding of what we're about to participate in. According to Zwingli, the bread and the wine are symbolic representations. And so it encourages remembrance, Encourages, it encourages personal reflection. And it is not so much the mystery of, 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 the, of the emblems that we focus on, but the partaking as a community of faith that makes this memorial so powerful and effective. And if we add Luther's understanding to that, it becomes even more powerful. 
God in Jesus Christ is present here because he approves of what we're doing here in remembrance of what Jesus did for us. We human beings tend to forget a lot. I was just having a conversation with, uh, with Jason Brown in the, in the court yet today around 9 o'clock this morning, and we we're both giving ourselves a very high, you know, big sigh of relief that it's Sabbath, because Sabbath is our time to reset our rhythm so that we just don't keep going like the Energizer Bunny until the battery runs out. Until we can't, get, we can't give anymore. Get going back into the rat race. Giving everything, doing, you know, and there's no stop to everything we do. And this is also a rhythm in its own sense. To help us reset for the next stretch. We Adventists follow Swingley's lead, along with many other Protestant Christians, Baptists, the Anabaptists, some Reformed churches. We can appreciate Luther's position, however, that Christ shows up in some mysterious way when things are done in faith as he commands. And yes, even though we disagree mightily with the Catholic position, we do appreciate their concern for reverence here as well. But you know, all this theologizing for all the good that it does, constitutes merely 50% of the whole thing. And perhaps this is one big reason why there is boredom among some, to the point where some would even not show up when it's communion. Because 50% leaves 50% unmentioned. It doesn't explain, explain what someone used to say, the rest of the story. What is the rest of the story? Boredom sets in when there's nothing for you to do, when action is minimal or missing at all. And the funny thing about it is that the, 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 the Lord's Supper is filled with, with, with action, but it is somehow or other that it is missed. Because a lot of times we posit everything on the, act, on the very act of participation, thinking that that is the whole thing, when it's actually only 50% of the thing. And so we leave this place thinking, that's it, I'm, set, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go, and uh, you know, I'll see you I mean, another 13, 13 weeks, and we'll do it again. Do that year in and year out, and boredom starts to set in. But action, the other 50% in this whole thing is missing. Where do we find it? Where do we find it? We find it in the last words of Jesus Christ when he says, do this in remembrance of me. Do what, Lord? Participate? That's only 50% of it. Yes, he wants us to do that too. What's the other 50%? To do this in remembrance of me speaks not only of participation, but also of imitation, of imitating what Jesus did without any semblance at all of thinking that we too are making the same sacrifice that Jesus did. That is to say, only one sacrifice was made for all mankind, humankind. And that sacrifice was made by Jesus Christ at the cross. It is never to be repeated again. It's once in, once in eternity uh, occurrence. But he wants you to participate in another way. And that is to participate in the very act of giving of oneself to the world that does not recognize him. So in the Lord's Supper, therefore, there is a seed of action. When Jesus Christ says, do this in remembrance of me, he wants you to participate here. And then when you leave this place, he wants you to do what he did for others outside the walls 
of this church. The other 50% of the Lord's Supper is not here. And it's only here by the first symbolic act that, 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 that succeeds, that follows this. And it is the act that we've already done. It is the, foot wa- the washing of each other's feet. That is a symbolic action that, te- that, 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 that tells, uh, that, that, uh, that, that we say among ourselves that, that we are going to be of service to one another and to others outside of the walls of our community of faith. That is why the Lord's, uh, I mean, the, 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 the uh, uh, foot washing is, is, is often called not just the ordinance of humility, but the ordinance of service. It is the seed of action. It is our first act. Affirming or, or, or agreeing with Jesus Christ or obeying Jesus Christ's command when he says, do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is our launching pad. This is why it is important that we keep repeating it. Because if we did, only did it once in our lifetime, we will forget. But if we do it as often as we do it, or even more in some churches, then we get to reset and to reboot and relaunch ourselves into the world like Jesus did and change the world for Jesus and sacrifice ourselves for the good of others. That is why this is important. That is the other half of the story. The action of Jesus at the first communion supper is to be imitated. And that action is encapsulated in these four things that our text tells us and can be summarized in in these uh, uh, four short sentences. He took, he blessed, he broke. He shared. What is it again? He took, he blessed, he broke, he shared. These four encapsulate who we ought to be out there after this communion service. He took the cup which contains his blood of the covenant, of the new covenant, in symbolic form. And in, the, uh, in Scripture, life is in the blood. And Jesus Christ would, uh, would have us give our life, not just for ourselves, but for others outside of ourselves, as he did. Give our life to the world that is indeed in need of a Savior. And the second thing he does is he blesses. He blesses. And what God wants you to understand is that you can be a blessing and you ought to be a blessing to the world because you are considered to be a blessing to God himself. You are completely blessed in the eyes of God. And then he broke, he broke the bread. Have you ever thought of this, that unless you really have a very large, um, I mean, um, appetite and a large mouth to go with it, can anybody swallow an entire bread without breaking it? Has anybody ever done that? Don't do that. Don't, don't, don't try to do that. I'm not trying to egg you on. Has anybody ever swallowed a, a loaf of bread without breaking it? Every bread that that can be eaten needs to be broken first. And you need to be broken as well. You don't go into the world whole. You go into the world broken. Humble. Not thinking yourself all that in a bag of chips. Not thinking yourself better than the rest of them because you have Jesus Christ. And they don't but humble and broken. You go and bless others 
as a broken person, and in the words of an author, a famous author, as a wounded healer. You yourself are wounded. You're broken. And that's who you share to the world, yourself. And he shared himself. This type of incarnational ministry to the world is what invites us to come here and reset. We're resetting when we participate. More than just remembering an action in the past, we're resetting for the present. We're resetting for the future. Remember that. And, and, and communion service will never be boring again. It will never be boring again. And perhaps gently nudge our brothers and sisters that, that stayed away, provided you know why they stayed away. Tell them why. We must all be here when communion is served. The early church centered around two activities. Um, two activities only. Very simple, right? And what were those activities? Both activities centered around food, eating and drinking. What was it? The agape feast. The other one, the Lord's Supper. And they did it in a rather informal way. This is a lot more formal than, 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 you know, I wanted to make it as less formal and more participatory, except that there are constraints that, uh, you know, modern world, the modern world puts, put on us, puts on us, and including this constraint right here, and COVID, and personal hygiene, all those things that they didn't have to worry about back then, we do now, so fine. We don't have to completely go back to the way it was. I wanted to, but somebody stopped me today and, and said, um, yeah, not everybody washes their hands. And it's true. And much to, our, to, to my uh, dismay, it, is, it, it does kill a little bit of the communal aspect of this thing because it's, it, is, it is never to be done alone. It is to be done as a community. The power of the, of the Lord's Supper is because we do it together. There is no such thing as a communion service done alone by one person. The Agape Feast and the Lord's Supper basically potluck and and communion. That's what they did. Every time they did, they did it. And they did it as often as they did. And, and, and in the early church, daily. Daily. All right? So they, everybody would bring food. They'd have potluck. Can you imagine potluck every day? We have ours once a month. Every day. And then that's when community happens. They eat, they eat, they eat together and break bread together. And yeah, they didn't have that for sure. For sure. Nobody was concerned about that as we are today. And then after that, there's the Lord's Supper. And what the Lord's Supper did for them was exactly what I told you. It was an opportunity to reset and to, and to, re, to start over and, and for the next stretch. Get them going for the next stretch. And you know what the word was that they used for this? It's not the Lord's Supper or the, the more uh, formal word, which is in, 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 in Greek, Eucharist. Eucharisteos. Giving thanks. That was not the original word they used. What, anybody could guess what, what the word was? The word is action. They did it last. It was the last thing they did whenever they met. They would, it, was, it, it was a more solemn thing. It was not something that one did before a meal uh, because nobody wants to, uh, you know, to, to hog the, the rest of the, the bread and, and leave everybody with no bread because you're, you're just hungry. Paul sp spoke about that, as a matter of fact, in his letter to the Corinthians. And... Uh, it was the last thing they did because they were getting ready to leave the place and they want to be ready for action. Action for what? To be Jesus Christ to the world that's dying without Christ. To prepare them for action. And so they would gather and then and then uh, you know after they after they they're done with the with, with this 
um, they would say the great amen, and that great amen propelled them to a world of imitation of Jesus, of the imitation of Jesus Christ out there in the world, taking their, their lives to the world, blessing the world with their bodies, breaking themselves, presenting themselves as broken individuals to the world, helping the brokenness of the world as they themselves are broken. No perfection called for here. Why stay away? You're not called to be perfect before you could come here or even after you've participated here. You're called to be broken here and out there and to share yourselves freely for the good of others. This is what animated the church in the first centuries. You know, this is the reason, this is the main reason why the participation in this propelled them to, to acts of, of, of heroic proportions to where they would give their lives as Jesus did. Not even thinking about it. Why? Because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. To go out into the world and be Jesus Christ in some small way to the world. As soon as they said, amen, everybody left. And they were ready for action. So the next time you come, it will be deja vu all over again. But it will be deja vu all over again of a different kind. It will be deja vu all over again of a better kind. Now that we know the 50% part that we haven't known until now. For more than just remembering, Jesus wants us also to remember what he did. Also wants us to remember what he calls us to do and to be in the world that's dying without Jesus Christ. Does that sound better to you? We take, we bless, we break, we share ourselves to the world sacrificially as Jesus did. Debbie, I want, to, I want you to come up here with your team right now as we, there's a reason why I, we, we, sh we shifted, I shifted the, uh, uh, the, the sequence of, of, of things here and the, sh and the partaking of the emblems here. Uh, it's because I wanted to do this very last. In fact, I thought about doing the, um, the foot washing last of all, but too many changes all at once might just kind of throw you into a tizzy and you know, I don't want to get in too much trouble for changing too many things at once. Maybe next time we'll do that. Remember what I said about the, the foot washing as the first symbolic action before we leave this place. That we are going to do what Jesus Christ wants us to do outside of the walls of this church. Maybe next time. But for today, the bread and the wine are, are set. And we're going to partake together. And remember what I just said to you. That we're not just participating here. We're getting ready for action. Because the Lord's Supper was called once as action. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And God's people say, Amen. Amen.